Da 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 dee dee. Oh, some of these days, you're gonna miss me, honey. Wa da da dee dee. Raspatas. Da 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 da. Wa da da. What? We're on the air. How come you guys didn't tell me? You mean I'm on the air now? You're going to ruin my career for Christ. Uh, hello, King. <laughs> <You're> in... <laughs> uh, this is uh, Uncle Wiggly here. <laughs> uh, it's so exciting, huh? Uh, it is. It's so exciting. Uh, it's uh, so exciting, yeah. Uh, uh, the, uh... The following program does not necessarily represent the deeply considered thoughts of the management. In fact, they don't want to have a darn thing to do with it. Uh, in fact, they've washed their hands of it. <laughs> you know how they are, chickening out all over the place. Oh, I mean, they're ready to sell out any time, but <laughs> that's a subject of another discussion. But And the, the program that you're about to hear does not ne- represent necessarily the well-considered thoughts of the performer who will perform these thoughts and ideas. Of course, that's a problem with all of us. Uh, we rarely perform any ideas that are well considered, but uh, that's another philosophical discussion. So, uh, could you please bring up the ding dong there, friend? There you go. <laughs> George. You can see why I'm never going to be Dick Cavett again. <laughs> then again, Dick Cavett ain't ever going to be Shepherd either, so six of one half of the other. Tip for tat. If I can use the expression. <laughs> but there you are. That didn't come through, did it? That's all right. That's just a bad thing here. I'm just drifting along with a breeze. Do you mind if I uh, sing here just for a moment? Do you mind? Oh, well, look, come on. Cut it out, will you? It's my show. Gee whiz. Oh, wow, we, you know, these, these people are getting so intolerant. Intolerance is just advancing just by leaps and bounds. You know, uh, yeah, 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 we're all very conscious of racial intolerance. Everybody knows about that now, and they're talking about class intolerance. You know what the worst thing is, is artistic intolerance. I mean, you people just totally intolerant of my singing. Would you please, uh, let's try a little bit there, please. Bring it on, hit it big. Hit it there, one, two, three, four. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Oh, some of these things, you're going to miss me, honey, papa. Some of these things, that are cool. you're going to be so lonely. You're going to miss my hugging. You're going to miss my kissing. You'll miss me, honey, papa, papa. When I'm up for the way, I'm going to split, split, split. Down you at 66. Yeah, trail and snow. Behind my old Jaguar. You're going to miss me, honey. You're going to walk around saying, how come I ever talk so bad at Great, beautiful, sweet man. Yes, sorry. Somebody stays. Happy, happy. Papa, 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 Oh, some of these things, you're going to miss me, honey. Oh, some of these things, you're going to be so lonely. You're going to miss my honey. Oh, papa, papa, 
Oh, come on, man. You're just fooling around now. Come on, you're talking to a serious artist here. Yeah. Awful. No, 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 I'm going to be the first to say it. So, though, that's not going to do you any good to write in and tell me it was awful, because I just told you it was awful, okay? <laughs> yeah, it's terrible. <sighs> yeah. Well, you know, uh, I, 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 there's a lot of reasons why I'm such a bad person. Uh, there are, there are, seriously. And uh, I, I think one of the reasons, that the basic reason, I really haven't talked much about it, is that I spent... Three years of my life as a paper boy. Uh, you know, delivering papers every morning and every night on a bike. And I want to tell you, friends, it ain't nothing that will teach you about life. F I F F F F Triple E. Lifey. There ain't nothing that will teach you about life quicker, more conclusively, more deeply, more solidly than to have a good paper route for a while, right at the very most plastic period of your life. <laughs> La -dee 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 -dee. Now, do you think I'm kidding? You want to hear a letter from a contemporary paper boy? Listen to this. He says, Shep, you are always giving us army stories, philosophical comments, various other facets of this grimy world. I'm quoting a kid here. <laughs> I like the way he writes. You are always giving us army stories, philosophical comments, and various other facets of this grimy world. But today, you mentioned your happy life as a paperboy. Okay, Shepard, how about some paperboy stories? I know you probably had some great ones. He says, I had some real winners. In fact, they happened to be last week. He says, <laughs> this guy's working right now as a paperboy. You want to hear one of his stories? He says, one morning, about 5.30 a.m., I was riding my bike and flipping papers when I heard a shrill voice screeching, Sonny, Sonny, come over here quick. And here was this old gray-haired dame with a shopping bag. At that time of day, she was either rolling drunks or smuggling dope. I couldn't tell which. But nevertheless, she was hollering for me and pointing her bony finger right at me. So I pedaled over to see what she was belly aching about. Quote, Look at this car, Sonny, she quavered. I think there's a dead man in there. Her upper plate was flapping like a kite in a stiff breeze. I looked in the car, and sure enough, leaning against the wheel was a sickly, green-looking corpse, apparently. Hmm. Well, I went around to the driver's side to get a better look. This neighborhood is not exactly Fifth Avenue, and an occasional result of gangland arguments showed up in that neighborhood now and then. As I got closer, I could feel my hair, which, uh was plastered down with stay comb, slowly start to rise on the back of my neck. I finally got up the courage to look straight at the corpse. Mm -hmm. I looked at it, and the corpse went, Ugh. it burped. I damn near jumped three feet in the air. All of a sudden, the dead man looked out at me with a pair of the reddest, rottenest-looking, watery eyes that I'd ever seen, 
and blew its 200-proof breath directly at me and said, quote, Damn it, kid, get the hell back to your paper, or I'll kick you right in the... That's been censored. The corpse had changed to an unhappy, totally bagged drunk, and I beat it out of there as fast as possible. Well, the old broad started screeching at the drunk about his foul mouth. But I was already three houses down before the fight started. <laughs> Little brief moment, you know, on the paper route. <laughs> he says, none, of course. There were the, he says, there were the sports who gave me a two-cent tip one week. Now, this is where you begin to learn about life, see. He says, they gave him a two-cent tip one week. And they next, we next week, they shorted me two cents, quote, Use the tip I gave you last week to make it up, Sonny. Oh, man. <laughs> he says, and then there were the ones, and this is so true. He says, there were the ones who would watch from behind the curtain for three weeks while you knocked at the door in hopes of collecting, and the fourth week, they moved. Oh, and guess who pays for the papers? That's right. Well, listen, I want to tell you. You know what the worst kind of klutz is? I mean, and, and he, he points it out here, and this, 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 this happened to me. And remember, when you're a paper kid, how old are you when you're a paper boy? Well, I'll tell you how old I was. I was 10. I, went, I was a paper kid from the time I was 10 to I was 13. And then, I, you know, I graduated. Then I became a, you know, I was a rack boy at the pool hall after that. But uh, <laughs> that's, I'm telling you the truth. And I also began to set pens. And, uh, you know, it was greasy kid stuff delivering papers. But, you know, there's a lot of satisfaction in delivering papers. Uh, to begin with, I wonder how many third basemen, and I, I specifically say third basemen, got their early training flipping papers. Now, you know, uh, if you don't know anything about baseball, I'm going to teach you something right, right here now. And here, you know, one of the most important parts of baseball is the throw. You know, is to learn how to throw. Well, the pitcher is one thing, and that's a directed throw, right? In other words, he's from a standard stationary point. He is throwing a ball towards a point that is stationary, a plate. Now, if he hasn't been drinking the night before, it stays right where it is. And so the pitcher walks out. He kicks the dirt around the mound a little bit, you know. He spits, walks around. He grabs the ball. He rubs it up a little bit. And then he, you know, he, he, he gets his hand set for his uh, fork ball. And, of course, you know, he's hiding it behind his back. Have you ever wondered what that pitcher's doing? To me, I wonder, I'm curious, you know, how, how people keep yelling about it takes too much time for the pitcher on the mound. You know, you keep, Leonard Coppett keeps talking about this all the time. Well, you see, the, the problem here, <laughs> only people who have never played baseball or certainly have never pitched would say that. Because part of the psychological battle that is going on between the batter and the pitcher is that time element. So if you got a nervous batter up there, I mean, a guy that's real nervous, and he's up there and he's whipping a bat, you know, you play it real cool. You walk around, you know, you look at the birds, and this guy, he's, you know, he's, he's, he's flipping, see? And then you, you, you walk, you advance slowly towards the rubber like you're going to pitch, and then you change your mind, you turn back again, you hitch up your pants, you know. By the time this... Listen, this guy's lucky if he gets a good solid pop up after that, you know. On the other hand, if you if you got a batter, you know, who's really cool, you know, like Frank Robinson, you know, real a real a real, you know, murderer, which reminds me this is W O R in New York. And uh, if you got a real heavyweight up there, you know, who takes it a phlegmatic type. Well what you do, you do the opposite. See? So this guy steps up to the plate, you know, and he digs in there and he's moving his shoulders. Zap! The ball goes past him. Gee, you know, it's strike one. And then he walks out of the box, he spits, he steps back in there, and he moves his... Zap! Over the outside corner, strike two. You know, you, this guy, you didn't ever give him a chance to set up. Yet. And by the time, you know, this guy's ready to swing, you've got four pitches past him, one ball and three strikes. Well, now that's, see, that's part of the thing. Did you ever think of it that way? That's the way it's done, friend. <laughs> In fact, when, when, it, when a really good pitcher is talking over the day, you know, what, what he's going to do that day with, uh, with his catcher, they go over the lineup, and they know each one of these. They not only know what the guy can hit, they know how he hits. 
So, so if it's a it's a real nervous batter, you know, the kind that's always tugging his hat and rubbing the back of his head and walking around scratching, you know, and taking something out of his eye. You know, this is a real nervous guy. This is the kind of guy that can hardly wait to get up there. And he's, he's really nervous. So uh, the pitcher will say, all right, uh, who's up? Uh, I see uh, Al Weiss. Nervous, okay. Uh, I'll tell you what we're going to do. Listen, uh, I'll get ready to pitch, and then you walk out to me, see, and uh, we'll talk about the party we had last night, and then you walk back, and by that time he's already flipping, see. He thinks his, uh, you know, his, uh, his belt is too tight or too loose by then. And then uh, when I step into the, when I'm getting ready to go up to the mound, see, I will better tell the, better tell the, uh, the coach, okay? Uh, get, get the trainer. Tell the trainer that on the second pitch I'm going to get something in my eye, okay? And then I want to come running out and squirt the stuff in my eye, see? And then on the third, okay, all right. And then they go to the next guy. Well, that's just apparently something they don't know in the sport pages. You know, they keep thinking, uh, you know, why didn't he throw it quicker? You know, that's like saying, how come Joe Namath doesn't always throw it to uh, Homer Bigelow, you know? He catches him good. You know? The point is, this is not the way the game is played. All right. Now, what about the other throws? Well, now, there's different types of throws. Now, for example, an outfielder. I, I used to play a little outfield once in a while. Now, the outfield throw is a throw of great sweep, you see. This guy, uh, accuracy is not as important as distance, you see. So you got to get that ball out there. And so this is a kind of throw. You'll see a guy with a big sweeping motion, and he lets that ball go. One of the great arms of all time, been several great arms, but uh, uh, DiMaggio had a good one. Roger Maris had a fantastic arm. All right? And so the outfield arm is one thing, but what about the third base arm? Well, I'll tell you about the third base arm. That can be almost any direction. So what happens? This batter gets up there, see, and he drops a bunt right down the third base line. You're playing third base. You come tearing in, you know, and this guy's lit out for first, you know. Hell bent for election. He's really going. This is Tommy Agee. See, he's moving like mad. So you come rushing in there. The ball is hopping along the first baseline. It's obviously not going to go foul. You scoop it up with your bare hand. Now you're running low. The ball is low. What can you do, you know? The only thing you can do is zap. You throw that horizontal throw in there. It's a sidearm, wild throw to first. Now that's a long throw from first to third, too, right? Yeah, you know I mean, you get that ball over from third to first. That's, a lo- that's the longest throw that is made in the infield, see? Okay? You got it? It's usually the most hurried throw, too, because of the distance. A lot of things. That is a perfect shot for a newsboy. Any guy who has ever ridden a bicycle in a high wind, in a fine misting rain, with a bag full of Chicago Tribunes on his back, has got the potential of being possibly a great third baseman. Because almost all the throws are either over the top of the head... I mean, that's a good throw, you know, over the top of the head like that, or between the spokes, underneath. You, you see, a lot of times you have to throw a, a paper down into a basement door, you know, zap. You never know where they're going to come at you. See, next thing, it's upper upper deck, zap, up there, you know. Here's a guy running out across his lawn. He says, here, throw it here, kid. Whap, you get that guy running, you know. He's being chased by a Doberman pincer. Whap, you give him another one. And so, <laughs> I was a natural third baseman. See, I used to go around, and of course, like all work, now, tonight's show is about work, and it's going to be a very important show for a lot of you who don't like work, right? Every job, if you're a digger, now listen carefully. I want, I want, hey, I want you to listen. Every, jo- every job, if you're a digger, begins to have its own basic private satisfactions that don't have much to do with the paycheck or anything else at the end of the week. Little things. Like, for example, uh, if you have to have a list ready by 10 minutes after 9, see, you come to work at 8, you have to have this list of uh, what the number 3, the number 7, what the, what the number 9 uh, shag scale mills did last night. And you have to, you know, you have to add it all up. Now, you have to have that done by 10 minutes past 9 every day, see, because the guy calls up and you have to give him the figures, right? Okay. One of the great little satisfactions is to have it done by five minutes to nine. So you say, ah, Big Charlie made it today. I got ten minutes to just pull him around, you know. <laughs> That's a little... Now, nobody else around him knows that he's got this little victory. 
his little victory. See, he beat his own time. Usually he just barely makes it. Or he half the time fakes it. So when the call comes at ten minutes past nine, he's unplugged his phone, see, so they can't get him. He pretends like he's busy or something like that. And so by 15 after, he gets it in. Now, these are all the little secret satisfactions of a job. Now, like, uh, oh, yeah, like engineers, for example, have little secret satisfactions. Like, like you'll see an engineer around here, and he's going to record a 45-minute show, see? So he goes back to get the tape, the tape reel. Well, now, he could get a one-hour tape, and he knows he's going to get 45 minutes on a one-hour tape. But the real satisfaction is to take a tape that looks like you could barely get 46 minutes out of it. You know, judge it by your eye, put it on, and by God, you get 45 minutes and 10 seconds out of it with only a foot and a half of tape left over. A little satisfaction. <laughs> right? Nobody knows these little things, you know. You just have to know them you know, yourself. It's like, uh, yeah, and when you're a performer, too, you get a lot of little satisfactions as a performer. I, I uh, uh, like, like some nights when you're doing a thing on the stage, see, and uh, for three weeks now, you've been trying this, <laughs> you know, here's, here, you've got a gag, you see, that's very funny to you, you know, you've been, it, it, it's very funny to you. And, and nobody laughs. It's not funny to anybody else. And then all of a sudden, on the end of the third week that you're trying this thing, there's a fantastic laugh. Hey! <laughs> and this is a little basic satisfaction you get that, uh, that just wouldn't be uh, known to the, the Probably the audience believes the satisfaction comes from the applause and from doing that. No, the real satisfaction of performing is to try things constantly, which uh, generally are failures, and then suddenly it works. Then, uh, conversely, one of the great irritations is to have it work on Wednesday and say, oh, that's great, now I've really got it working. And then on Thursday, you do the same thing, they'll boom! Oh, man, you know, people start to say, oh, what a bad joke. <sighs> what did I do? I did it wrong again. <laughs> so everybody has his own little satisfactions. I'm sure that every one of you who've got a job out there, even going to school, man falls into this very early. You know, you, you start this as a kid. It's like, uh, you know, you got your assignment done five minutes before it was to, was to be handed in. This is a great little satisfaction. Oh, you have your notebook in nice order. <laughs> And, uh, and these are all little basic things which are never talked about, which are private. Well, as a newsboy, one of the great satisfactions you, you develop this thing, you see, is when you have difficult shots when you're throwing papers, real difficult shots, and you try different ways to, sh to, to throw it. Like, like there was one specific doorway that I always remember, and, and that I used to look forward to this point on my, on my route. It was a long stairway that went up in this two-story building. See, it was a stairway that just went right up, but the door was open on the bottom all the time. Now, there was, there was an apartment on the ground floor and one on the top floor, and there was a long, straight stairway that was lit with light bulbs that went right up inside this building, and you could see the landing up there. Well, now, the person who lived in the top apartment, they had this scrub pail that they always had on this landing would sit right in the corner. Well, the first couple of weeks, I'd just throw a paper up there, and it would land up on the landing, see? And one day, by just by accident, I threw the paper up, and instead of it landing in the landing, it hit the wall behind the landing, and it was like a bounding board, just like a backboard, see, on a, on a basketball court. It went ka-dunk, it bounced off the other wall, and zap right into the pail. Shepard canned another two points. <laughs> so I'm dry. I said, "Gee, Shepard hits it. You know, man, the, the difficult push shot from the, you know, from the free shot line. Shepard really." So the next day, I tried to do it, and I just missed. And every day, that was my big moment. And I got so I was really wild at it, really great. I'd come in, you know, underhand shot. At I'm riding. Remember, I'm riding on a bike. I'm not. This is not from a stationary shot. I'm riding on a bike. I'd go swooping past this door and zap right up this thing. And I'd see it. Thunk, thunk, and by the time I was, uh, oddly enough, I never really saw it go into the pail. See, because I was already past the door, and I'd hear it go, boom, boom, ka-bang. Oh, what a sense of sadness. It was going to be a good day, see? So these little things are, are very important to a newsboy. And then, of course, another thing, too, is, uh, this is a little, another little satisfaction, is to learning, learning, really learn how to fold papers. 
Now, you can always tell a really amateur paper deliverer who has a rubber band on him. Forget it. That guy is a, that's greasy kid stuff. <laughs> I'm serious. Anybody that puts a rubber, you've seen him with a rubber band on it? This is a guy that uh, not only is an amateur, he's worse than an amateur. He's a fake. You know, I don't mind a badly folded paper. That's an amateur. But a real fake is a guy that puts a rubber band on it. He used to sit there, you know, make the... And, and of course, you can tell how good a newsboy is, is how small he can fold the paper. Now, that means that, the, that the, you know, the smaller the paper is folded, the more you can get in the sack and the less bulk the sack takes up. And the better it throws. And so, so you know, after about the oh six or seven months, you know, I used to re envy these other guys. For example, Flick was a, you know he used had to have paper out, and uh, the two of us had him. And Flick had started before I did, and Flick was fantastic. He could he could fold fifty papers in about five minutes flat. Zap, zap, hard as a rock. He would take he would take a a, a ten pound Chicago tree. It was about the same size as the as the Times here, big paper, you know. He would take a, a, a Chicago Tribune, like the end of the week trip, which was a Friday trip, you know, to come out just before all the ads for the weekend stuff. He'd take this Friday trip, he would fold it up roughly the size of an Eversharp pencil. Unbelievable. Fantastic. And, you know, it was just like magic. So I, I was always envying Flick, you know, and I, I'd have a big sack, and my, I'd have no more papers than he would, and my sack would be so big, you know, I was like Santa Claus on the beginning of his rod, you know, fantastic, I looked like a, a guy carrying a gigantic uh, captive balloon with him, you know, whereas Flick would have this little sack <laughs> hanging on him, boy, well, I, I began to work on my paper folding technique, and today you are listening, friends, right now to a legend. I mean, when you work at it, you know, some, of course, talent is involved. And uh, I, I began to work, and I realized by the time I was folding papers after maybe a month and a half that I was one of the great paper folders of our time. In fact, even Flick came to me one day, and he says, by God, you do it. And, you know, that's like, you know, like being told by Roger Maris, you got a good swing, kid. It's a great moment. And so this was a little satisfaction. But then, the greatest satisfaction of all, and this is possibly why I turned out to be such a sneaky person, is out euchring the great unwashed slob public. They are the ultimate enemy, friend. This is where it is. I mean, you can, you can, you can beat the paper. I mean, this, this poor little paper is just a piece of paper. You know, you can ultimately learn to control that. You can ultimately learn to be a pretty good shot, you know, Riding on a bike and uh, throwing a sidearm shot up into the upper deck of a... I used to pretend, by the way, I was involved in various sports. How many of you have sport fantasies when you're doing things? Like, like you know, you come into the office seat and you take this piece of paper, you fold it up, and you say, zap, over the corner. Shepard cans another one. There it comes out. Will Chamberlain's bringing it out. Shepard is bringing it in out of the center line. <laughs> These are all little fantasies. And I used to... It would vary by the season. So if it was the springtime... Shepard was always making these spectacular throws from third. I was always seeing myself, you know, as picking up this bunt, the very hard shot, and picking off a runner. What a, what a play. Now, if it was in the fall, Shepard was always making these beautiful backhand passes. You know, he was always throwing a basketball. I always saw myself, you know, as coming in. Shepard throws it up. What a passing. What a magnificent passer. There is a real playmaker, Shepard. You know, I throw myself... Well, now, these, these various fantasies are part of the, of the day-by-day life. That I wonder if anybody's ever written a major philosophical treatise on the daydreams of ordinary work. No, I'm, I'm asking a question. Any of you out there involved in experimental psychology, has anyone ever written... Now, this is not Walter Mitty. No, no, don't, don't uh, come in and uh, give me a... Uh, uh, believe me... Uh, Woody Allen me no Woody Allens. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the little vague satisfactions and daydreams that carry us through our daily work, our daily life. I wonder if anyone's ever written about this. Well, I'll tell you this. One of the great satisfactions I discovered as a, as a newsboy was the human combat and to win. Now, <laughs> when, you're, when you're 11 years old, and you're delivering papers, you are almost at the mercy of everybody. Because, you know, they don't take you seriously. 
And it took me about six months to realize I was being had. I would, there was a certain kind of customer, and this, this is, you find this guy a lot in life, who, uh, you come, you know, you, here it is Saturday morning, it's collection day, right? Okay. Now there's the, there's the one that he pointed out, the guy that hides behind a curtain, see, and never, he, he, he's not gonna pay at all, see. That's his gambit. He's a deadbeat. Now I'm not discussing deadbeats, I'm talking about sharpies. Sharpies is another thing. So, uh, <laughs> In other words, chutzpah is not exactly the same as uh, being a deadbeat. So I would come up to this door, like any other door, you know. I'd knock on the door, and a guy would come. This guy, blurry eyed like, what do you want, kid? Say, uh, uh, it's time to, I'd like to collect the paper, please. And I'd have my little book out, you know, you owe 86 cents. And they'd uh, say, I, I, just a minute, will you, kid? Okay, uh, he'd come back and say, hey, listen, uh, all I got is a ten dollar bill. Uh, you got change for ten? Uh, you know, when you're when you're making eighty six cent collections, you're not going to have a change for a ten, right? Okay. Well, he knew that. That's why he did it. Then you'd go pedaling on, so you couldn't collect. So there you are. You know, say, well, I'm sorry, kid. All I got is ten. You know. So what are you going to do? So I would go on. Well, this, this would go on. Sometimes it would go on for a month. And the guy, what he was doing, he really just seriously wasn't paying, you know. He, he would always say, you got change for a 20, kid? And then one day, it hit me. This is an act with this guy. Just sitting there. I was sitting there one day, folding my papers, and I'm getting bugged. I'm thinking about this, because there were about five guys on the route that were doing this. So I turned to George the Greek, and I said, hey, George. He said, yeah. I says, hey, George, can I borrow from you $10 and change? Do what do you want it for? I said, I want $10. I'll give it back to you. I said, so I never had 10 bucks. But George said, what do you want it for? I said, well, I just want to collect from some guys. You give me, give me 10 ones. And George says, okay. And don't forget now. I said, you owe me 10 bucks. George the Greek, by the way, was the guy that ran the newspaper agency. So I, 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 I now I've got 10 one dollar bills. I got him stuck in my left pocket. My working change is in my right pocket. So I go out. It's Saturday. See, so I go out. I'm going on the road. See, and I'm, I can hardly wait. I'm setting this guy up. See? <laughs> and he was a big slob. You know, worked out the roundhouse. You know, the kind that always comes there with his underwear shirt and the hair on his chest sticking out. You know, you could smell last Saturday's beer on him. And he's got a, you know, three-day growth of beard and... You know, the sleazy, you just feel the sleazy. Can you imagine the animalistic life? The, the, great, <laughs> the greatest description I ever heard of that type of guy was done by S.J. Perlman. i got to give credit to, to, uh, to Perlman for this. He's talking about a guy that jumped in his swimming pool, this real slob, and he says he lay there snorting through his blowholes. <laughs> These people don't breathe. they got flippers and fins. See, so... This guy, he's waiting for me. So I'm knocking the door. I finally wait. You know, I finally all the way through the route. I'm looking forward. I can hardly wait for this moment. You know, for for him to to, to come to this guy's house. So I'm pedaling along and I'm collecting. And some people pay, some don't. You know, and so finally I get to this guy's house. I'm ready. See, I walk up to the door, knocking the door, and I got my book out. See, and I'm playing it like I always did. See, and the door opens, and there's big fat slob Charlie. Say, what do you want, kid? As if he didn't, and he knew what I wanted. You. What do you want, kid? I said, I'm here, sir, to collect for the paper. Oh, gee whiz, you know, you woke me up. All right, all right. Uh, hold on a minute, kid. This was his bit, see. He always would pretend like he's going back to, you know, get the dough. So he comes back out. He says, oh, I says, I'm sorry, kid. He says, you got change for a 10? I said, why, yes, I certainly do. He said, what? I says, I certainly do. I have change for a 10. You know what I said, kid? I asked you, you got change for a 10. I said, well, yes, sir, I have change for a 10. Right here. How do you want it? You want it in ones? <laughs> yeah, my God. I take the 10 ones out, see, and his face fell like a, like a giant lantern that's been blown out. You know, just, it, was, it, was, it was like a, you know, just all of a sudden he became a small child, just like that. You know, his face fell. It was kind of like, are you sure you got change for a 10? Let me see that. 
Oh, I see. Yes, sir. Here. Uh, let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I have ten one dollar bills. And then I realized he didn't have ten. He was faking it. He sort of stood there for six. Well, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, listen, uh, can you come back next week? I said, yes, sir. I certainly can. Okay. And down the steps I go. Now, I didn't care, you know. I didn't get the doll. But I want. I really want. And so I'm pedaling out, you know, nine feet tall. I'm throwing up papers and making a collection. Two and a half hours later, I arrive back at George the Greek's. I'm going to walk in to George, you know. Flick is sitting on the floor and he's working on his book. And Schwartz is over there and he's working on his book. And Martin is over there and he's working on his book. Shepard walks in and I come striding in there ten feet tall. George is hanging back around there by the candy counter. He says, hey, Shepard. I say, yeah, what's up, George? Don't give me that what's up stuff. All right, what did you do to the guy on 1014... Arizona Avenue. I said, what do you mean? He said, all right, don't give me what do you mean. What did you do? Just tell me what you did to him. I said, nothing, George. He said, what do you mean, nothing? That guy crawled up here, he dropped all the papers, and the guy says he's never going to buy another paper from me again. That guy's been on our route for 20 years. What did you do? That was big, fat, rotten, stinking Charlie. Now, I ask you, friends, who won that battle? Ultimately? Well, let's put it this way. There are some people who win an occasional skirmish. There are even some people who win an occasional battle. But then there are those wondrous favored few. Those beautiful, wondrous favored few. Now, over here. Those wonderful you who win the wars. Friends, you are listening to a guy who has won quite a few skirmishes. I've even taken a battle or two. And so tonight's salute to misspent you. <laughs> Some night I'll tell you tales of the poor room. Some of these things happy. Papa, 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 Reset it. <laughs> now, did you enjoy that story of the news world? Now, that's a true story. Now, any 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 guy who's ever worked the newspaper out knows exactly what I'm talking about. And, uh, of course, uh, uh, <laughs> there were other things. But I, I then I remember, you know, some of the great things on the newspaper. I remember there was a lady, uh, a big, fat lady, I'll never forget her, who, who came from Kentucky someplace. Big, fat lady who must have been close to 80. And uh, this lady, every Saturday I came there. Now, obviously, she had no money at all, this lady. Hardly any. It was a little tiny joint, you know. And, and I've always liked people. I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe, again, it's my newspaper boy training. But I've always somehow had a great respect for people who buy a newspaper every day. I mean it. I mean, really, these, these, are, these are people that are with it. Now, I don't care what paper they buy. The idea that they feel the need to read a newspaper every day has somehow seemed to me to be a great thing. <laughs> now, I'm serious. And I've known people who are absolutely, you know, dead broke and who have nothing, really, to, to work on, who will always get a paper. Um, what, whatever paper it is they can get, will always get a paper every day 
even when they have no money to spend on anything else. Now, these, are, these somehow are really admirable people. Now, I, I'm talking about a very personal judgment and a very personal observation, but maybe it comes from this one lady. I remember this lady. There was a big, fat woman who, as I said, she must have been 80 or close to it, who lived in this little house. Obviously, no friends. Never, you never saw anybody else there. She was all alone. And every, every Saturday, this lady would have her 86 cents, or whatever it was, for the papers, to the penny. See, she would, she would have this money, and she would come out and give it to me, and then she would do something else. Every Saturday, she would give me two cookies that she made for me. She would make these cookies Friday night that she would have, probably give some of the friends or somebody she had, you know, kids she knew, but she would make these cookies so that I would have two cookies every Saturday. Now I, you know, I I dug this, you know, and and uh, and and by the way, another curious thing, I find that quite often the poorer the person is, the less likely he is to try to chisel. But poor people almost invariably pay their bills. What you think that one out? Now I'm not talking about people who are broke. That's somebody else. I'm talking about poor people. I'm talking about people who really have very little earning power, whose, uh, whose earnings are low, uh, people who work in some kind of a small, menial job or don't even have a job at all, who uh, may have a little check from some disability or something, these people almost always are the absolute best credit risks. And yet, they're the people least likely to get credit, ironically. And I tell you, this is, you know, working the news route that there were certain people who I knew would pay no matter what. And they were almost always the people who had nothing. And I used to feel kind of funny about it, you know, because I would go past this one. I remember the Strickland. I'll tell you, that on, on my paper, because my paper, I cut through a great wide swath of earning. In other words, part of my route was on, you know, the, 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 the big end of town where the, the superintendents of the mill and the all big shots all lived. All the way on down to the places where, you know, I had the old widow ladies and so on, way down at the other end of town. And I, I remember many times, I remember so many times, the Strickland's, for example, it was one of the worst to get them to pay for the 86 cents worth of the paper. I mean, I used to practically have to crawl in there on my hands and knees. I remember the maid paying me sometimes because they wouldn't pay. The maid would be embarrassed. And, you know, it was one of these places with trellises all over, and roses, and nine-car garage, and a long sweeping driveway with, the, you know, the whole business. And then I would get down to this old Kentucky lady, you know, 80, 80 years old, and she would pop out, and she would give me her 86 cents, counted to the penny, you know, and the two cookies. So I don't know. Now you understand why I'm such a rotten person. Why I've never totally bought the beautiful people. Ha, ha, ha.